RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers and welcome to the cave for another show and tell. Today we've got Andy with us. Andy, thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, great to be here. And we're talking all about these things, light guns. Um, something that has really bothered me for the last, I reckon the last 20 years, Andy. Um, do you remember that period in the late 90s to early 2000s when we made the switch from the big heavy CRT monitors? And it was convenient, we got a lot of desk space back by getting rid of them, but we also lost a lot with that. Um, there's something that I lost, which I really loved, was a pair of Elsa Revelator glasses. I don't know if anyone else had them. These were active shutter glasses, which were stereoscopic, so you could play DirectX games. Colin McRae was my favourite, and it gave you, you were looking into the monitor and it gave you that stereoscopic depth. And to have the depth over the rally car's bonnet was a massive help in judging the corners. It was brilliant. But when we switched to flat screens, they didn't have a high enough refresh rate to serve both of those eyes um, so I had to get rid of them and of course we also lost the ability to use light guns. Yeah so the light guns really needed the the speed of the CRT TV mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the computer would control it directly and it would know when it received the light through the light gun exactly what, what it was drawing at that time and therefore know where it was pointing mm -hmm. and with LCD TVs that refresh rate is not there it's not consistent you know when it's Something like this, when the Wii is drawing on the TV, it doesn't know what is being shown at any one moment. Mm. So, unfortunately, they didn't work at all. So we got these great new 30, 40 inch televisions, which yeah. would be amazing for something like that. You know, high res, 3D graphics, Yeah, but it doesn't work. And the solution they came up with um, is to put sensor bars with the Wii, to put a sensor bar above your TV, and then you have the Wii mote, and it's, it's infrared, isn't it? Um, and it always bothered me because there's a um, certain amount of lag that just didn't feel as responsive. I, I'm sure anyone else out there who's tried it feels the same. It's just not the same. And they did get around it on the arcade games, on the uh, big expensive arcade cabinets, you'd have sensor bars all around, four, six, maybe even eight sensor bars. And that did resolve it to a degree. Yeah, I think it did It did work like that. It's just, uh, unfortunately, we're a picky bunch. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what we want around our nice shiny TV that we spent a thousand pounds on to put sensor bars all around the edge, yeah. unfortunately. Absolutely. So. And clearly, this bothered you like it bothered me. <laughs> but you went ahead and did something about it. Well, I mean, I didn't do very much for sort of 15 years. So right. um, <laughs> just like everyone else, I, I suffered as well. But... Um, Recently, actually, uh, so just just kind of um, under two years ago, my, my parents messaged me. They said, um, we've been tidying the loft. We found this. Are you interested? So, um, I mean, we'll see if we can show a picture while we're talking about this. But they, they'd found my old NES. Mm -hmm. So this is a NES with a, a zapper. With a, It's actually got a, a little robot called the Rob. For I guess quite a few people will be familiar with that. And unfortunately, none of those things worked. Um, right. You know, I've seen the Rob. I've never used it. It looks like it sort of stacks things or something. What does the Rob do exactly? <laughs> yes, so the idea is you play you, pl you play the game on the one hand and then you're actually trying to control this Rob and he's spinning these gyros and, and as you say, stacking things to open doors and things right. like that. So it's probably not the greatest gaming experience. <laughs> but uh, again, it's it's something that's sad that doesn't work, you know, for a lot of people. Mm. Um, you know, but the technology important. behind it was similar to light guns, is that right? Well, it was actually... Um, it would it would look at the TV, you know, so it had a sensor in it and it would pick it up. So it didn't really care where it was looking at the TV, but it'd be it'd be detecting sequences of flashes, mm -hmm. um, and that's obviously just what doesn't work on the LCD. That it's it has, it's not flashing when it expects it to flash, and it, it doesn't work. Right. Okay. Okay. So that bothered you. <laughs> yeah. Did you get Rob working, or did that just set your mind going uh, onto the light guns? It was. It's the disappointment at that moment that, you know, kind of 50 inch TV, how great it would be to play, you know, some of these games, yeah. you know, especially something like Duck Hunt, which you know, means a lot really to a lot of people, or even something like this here, you've got Operation, Operation Wolf, Wolf over here, yeah, in the corner kind game. of, um, you know, <laughs> like an heritage. Um, and, um, but it's when you analyze the problem, it seems like something that can be solved. And you see this all the time in forums, you know, where someone says, oh, why is my light gun not working? And people tell them, and the, the reaction is, 
oh, surely you could do this or you could do that, you could do that. And it's mm. almost everything that everybody tried just didn't work and it yeah. wasn't fit for purpose. And aside from uh, the Nintendo Wii, Aimtrack tried to make a commercial product. They did make a commercial product and I reviewed it on the channel some time ago. And I found it to be just like the Wii. It relied on a sensor bar and there was always a sense that you were dragging the crosshair around rather than pointing and shooting. And you lost that immediacy. You know, you weren't in the game. You were thinking more about the mechanics of the gun than actually playing the game. Yeah, it, it's such a uh, specific gameplay mechanism, mm. you know, and that your brain is very clever. If it, if it sees the cursor, you know, it, it will use it. You know, if you move to the right-hand side of the screen, you'll wait for the cursor to refresh on the TV, you know, in front of your target, make sure it's all lined up before you, you know, you hit go. And you just can't get away from that. Your brain's too, too clever. But if you remove the crosshair, they're not actually very accurate. So mm. what they do is when you when you calibrate these uh, with your sensor bar, you're only calibrated for that exact position where you're holding the gun. So you know if I'm holding, it'd be better with one of these, and I'm I'm holding it right here. You know if my arm gets a bit tired and I sort of go like this and I'm shooting like that, it's no longer accurate. I if I pass that. it to you, yeah. and say here you go, you have a go. It it's no longer accurate. So you leave yeah. the crosshair on. You know, otherwise it becomes too frustrating a gaming gaming experience always being inaccurate. But then once you've got that, it's just it's just not the same. I found exactly that with the aim track. As soon as I took a step back, it was all out of calibration, and you had to stop, drop out the game, recalibrate, get back in. It was a real pain. Now, um, how did you get then from your NES and your Rob <laughs> to, uh, to developing a light gun? Well, what happened? Just like everyone else, I thought I can solve this. No, no problem. And I thought what I do is I will draw. A board around the screen, I will detect the, the television with a camera in a gun and I will work out where that border is in relation to where the, the centre of the, the photo is Right. and I will therefore know where it's pointing and I will track that real time at high speed and I'll interface it, I'll make it work as a, as a mouse because all the emulators on, on the PC they all work as a mouse, in fact even games that have come out they work with a mouse um, and I built it and it worked. So, you know, and it worked, um, it was, it, I was amazed because I, I'm not an electronics expert, you know, but how well I was able to get it to work. I mean, it took a lot of time, don't get me wrong, but kind of after a lot of hard work. And we do have that first prototype here, yeah. so can we grab that? Yeah, of course, we'll let's take grab a look that. at that. So this is very familiar. This is the housing for a Wiimote, much like this one, although yep. this one's a bit more chunky. <laughs> um, but you've got the space to put your electronics in there. Now, the way you describe this, detecting a rectangle with a camera working out where you are, it seems like quite a simple concept. Why, is, why has nobody else thought of this? <laughs> but that's, that's the amazing thing. I mean, we've seen some solutions from um, Sony over the years. They did the PS3 Move. I don't know if you've seen that. Uh -huh. they, essentially, they're tracking a, like a, a lit ball at the end of a gun. Um, and again, that loses calibration very easy. It seems a bizarre solution that's just not really fit for purpose, but it's gone as far as getting it out there to consumers. And I guess the idea with this is that you don't need to calibrate it. So this, this is the real strength of the product in that it doesn't really matter what angle you're at or where you're coming from is that it can see the rectangular border. Even if it's distorted, it can understort it and work out you know, what angle it's coming from and actually line it up perfectly. Sure, sure. so there's the camera in the end, it's detecting the rectangle on the screen. There's no calibration process whatsoever. So you're not pointing at all corners of the screen. No. And whatever you've got in here is working quick enough to work out the angle, the skew, the perspective of the television, no matter how far or back you are. Or exactly, yeah. That yeah. sounds backwards. very promising. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm excited, but I've been disappointed so many times over the last 20 years that I'm going to remain skeptical <laughs> until we actually get to use this. And this is not its final form. You've developed this even further, haven't you? Yeah. So, so can we see revision sure. two of the light gun? <laughs> and this is the one we'll be using today, is it? Yes, that's right. Excellent. Right. So um, basically, uh, uh, I looks a... good. <laughs> that looks good. <laughs> Go ahead. I had a, a proper three D designer. Yeah. Um, you know, who's basically he's designed this. Um, I mean, even this is still there's still a few tweaks to do this, but this is um, a three D print mm -hmm. using technology called SLS. Um, essentially you get a, a bed of powder, it does sort of one layer at a time, so you can actually 3D print exactly whatever you like, it doesn't matter whether, you know, nothing has to be supported, it can do that, and that's the technology here, and I've, I've dyed it a sort of a dark blue as well. 
Um, and this is actually what the inspiration for the final product will be like. Um, you know, it'll be very similar to this. It will actually have a few more action buttons. Um, it's got the reload slider as well. I don't know if you want to just show that. So, reload. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't resist uh, adding that. And um, the idea, it's, it's, it's loosely based around, you know, the, the arcade gap guns, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of the size of those, you know, it's meant to be that, that type of feel, um, you know, bring back that kind of experience. Yeah, very similar to the Namco gun. Are these identical buttons on either side? So you've got two. Uh, they're actually assignable. Buttons? Yeah, they're assignable. So, yeah, okay. and there's, there's actually going to be another four on the additional on the final one for actually controlling menus and things. But you can choose what you want them to be. So I mentioned that it kind of runs as a mouse. You can select them as a right click, a middle click, a keyboard click. Um, you know, or even change some of the settings of the gun if you want to tweak tweak different things. Mm. So you can assign it. So it supports right and left-handed uh, people. You know, they can assign it to whatever they like. Yeah. And in terms of the technology inside this compared to Revision 1, any upgrades or is it just a new housing? Yeah, no. So it's a, it's a custom PCB as well done by, um, you know, some proper electronics specialists that have helped me with that. So it's kind of an all-in-one integrated board, um, you know, a nice long cable that comes out. It's, it's kind of gone ahead really to the production stage. Mm -hmm. um, the one stage that's missing is the injection molding, yes. um, sort of holding that to the last minute, really, that's a very big financial yeah. outlay. Yeah, well, we'll talk about future plans for this in a moment. I think it's time that we tried this out because I can't talk anymore. I need to, <laughs> I need to kill Andy. Need to shoot something. <laughs> Let's get this set up and uh, yeah, we'll see how it performs. Help me! Andy, the more I'm using this, the more excited I'm getting about it. It, it actually works. So there's a machine gun hidden in that box if you can uh, get it. Yes. Got it. So you don't need to reload with that. You can. Oh, good job on this, Tim. Very nice. Oh, hey. you did pretty. You did pretty good there. That was good. Yeah, this for me is the ultimate test of a light gun, and this is the one that really, uh, when I had the aim track, it was, it was the reason I got rid of it. Is that well, if I can't play my favourite light gun game, dragging a cursor around, then I'm not happy with it. But this I'm getting on a lot better with. Shoot 45 or more windows, okay. So now, now you're doing the special <laughs> point blank trigger technique. Oh, I'm struggling, come on. I'll take out that, yeah. Had it come in that stained glass window, had it. Boom! So Andy, this is the configuration tool that you've programmed. What are we looking at here? Well, I think it's whenever you're setting it up, it helps to see what you're actually, what you're looking at. You know, so for instance, if, if we had some issues and we're thinking, well, is it is this is time box, time crisis box causing an issue? Is there a problem with the lighting? At least you can see here what it's actually detecting. And you can see the speed of doing it. I mean, actually, if you twist the gun a little bit while you're looking at it. It's hard to even move it faster than the 
the refresh on the right. It's, it's when you're looking so, at it, it's hard to. So the left is the raw camera. Yeah. The right, where the where the crosshair is. Yeah. That is where it would register the shot. Yeah. So I can twist it. It's it's instantly updating. Um, I can come down at it from different angles, up high, and yeah, it's still detecting that that white border. So the white border is necessary to make it work? Yeah, yeah, there is alternatives. You can go a thinner border, you can go different colours. Sometimes the games themselves have enough around the defined edges where you actually you don't need the border. Um, I think one thing that's quite cool here is we've got a lot of stuff in the background, a lot of square boxes, a lot of things like that, and it's not picking up any false positives, if you can see. Yeah, we've got the lights any... changing colour in the background, yeah. yeah. I purposefully put the boxes around because you said it detects rectangles. Well, you couldn't have more rectangles if you tried with the apple carts and with the boxes on the table, and, and that's fine. The hostages are trapped! Great. We've got to help them! Aim carefully and don't hit the hostages! to be a bit braver and uh, take a yeah. few more chances with the hostages, I think. Yes. Good job, look at all those happy faces. <laughs> Andy, um, I had great fun playing some of the old and some of the newer games. There, were, there was a brand new game we played there. What was that one called? Uh, that's Fright Fearlands. Fright it's Fearlands. an arcade game. A yeah, recent one. And we played a mixture of um, emulated games. We ran the Daphne emulator. Um, what else did we run? Uh, ran some um, retail versions of House of the Dead, just mm -hmm. to show as well. I mean, not a lot of people know that, you know, they did release these arcade um, light gun games on the PC, and you can actually get these. I mean, the great thing is you can buy these for sort of 50p from CEX, yep. you know, and if you hook those up with a Sindon light gun, you are getting to play some of the very best games that there are there. Do you have any figures in terms of response times? Yeah, I mean, so it uses a 60 frames per second camera. Right. So that's, um, you know, obviously that's that's kind of quicker than the human eye, really, because I think 30 frames a second is, is meant to be almost too quick for the human eye. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of actually processing the rectangles and things, it does that in less than five milliseconds, you know, sometimes as quick as one or two. So in terms of the response, the computer knows really instantly, you know, compared to the human speed of thinking, it knows exactly where you're pointing. Mm -hmm. What's the future for the Sindon light gun? Where are we well, going next? So the exciting thing is I've um, got a kickstart around the corner. Um, so as I was talking about earlier, I've kind of got the PCB ready, got the design ready, got the software ready. Um, it's really to get the minimum orders number that I right. need. You know, So when you're buying these components, um, really sort of 250 is the minimum that you need to do that. Mm -hmm. So the Kickstarter doesn't really pay for any of the, the other stuff that's gone in, the productionizing or even the injection molding. It's just to get enough orders to make it worthwhile. Right, okay, so it's not a Kickstarter to cover the cost of everything. You just want to get enough to market to get attention yeah. and to see where it goes next. Yeah, I mean, it's... I don't necessarily want to lose money on actually the making of each gun, and yeah. that's that's the one thing that the Kickstarter gets me is that it you know it covers it covers the price of the components, and it, it's um, you know if I sold twice as many, I don't lose twice as much money. You sure. know that that money's already sunk, unfortunately. Sure. Okay, well the Kickstarter isn't live at the time of recording, but I think by the time this goes out, it will be live. Yeah, so check the video crossed. description below for a link to the Kickstarter page, and you can find out more. Any idea on what you're hoping to sell these at? Yeah, it's probably around the 80 quid okay. price. Um, that's probably about $100, anyone watching from the US mm -hmm. around the world. Um, probably a little bit of postage. And if I signed up to Kickstarter and pledged my £80, what would I be getting, Andy? Yeah, so, I mean, this is the, 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 the basic option, really, is that you get one light gun, Sindon light gun, you're able to play all these games. Um, really, it's about fun. So a lot of this is uh, I'm creating a forum for it where I'm kind of getting lots of different games to work. I'm, I'm working on new emulators. So for instance, I'm working on the uh, the PlayStation 3 emulator at the moment, hoping to get that working. So, you know, if you play those types of games or you remember playing those games, you know, get them to work with the Sindon light gun. Um, it's really just to emphasize it's about, it is about fun. It's not just about releasing a, a product. Um, there is a couple of extra options. So I'm looking at a recall option which nice. would be really really fun um, and also there is a two-player pack 
available as well because playing with a friend is, is great. I know it's one thing we didn't do today, but um, you know, playing two-player, some of these, these classic games is great fun. Yeah, and presumably that technology can quite easily be transplanted into any other shape, whether it was a, a replacement Nintendo Super yeah. Scope or a, an old <laughs> NES-style Zapper. Um, I'm sure further down the line, if you have success uh, and you get the funding behind it, yeah, I mean, a kit is a definite option. So I know a lot of people have um, arcade machines, um, you know, and they want to have the same gun that works right. with that. Yeah. You know, so um, we'll be looking to do a kit as well so you can retrofit those and get those up and running. Excellent. And beyond this version one, do you have other plans to improve upon it? Yeah, I mean, so something really exciting we've not even mentioned today, I've not even told you this, is it actually can detect where you are in a 3D sense. So it's able to use this, this rectangle. It's able to see how the rectangle is, is distorted and know exactly where you're pointing from, from your living room at the television. So what you can actually do is you can create this 3D effect where you start to change what you're seeing, where you can actually move around an enemy. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, I think so within the game itself, you could be hidden behind a box on a flat surface, but as you walk left and right in the real space, it will sort of peek yeah. around the box. And yeah, and there is actually, yeah. if, assuming that you're, you're holding it where your eyes are, there's actually a real 3D effect that you get which, as you're moving round, you can actually see that, that 3D effect. You know, your brain thinks that it can see round and it understands mm. what's, what's going on. So there's opportunity there. Um, that's not gonna happen overnight, unfortunately, but actually the technology does mean that you can start doing cool stuff. So I, I would like to see in the future that type of thing happening. In terms of the immediate roadmap, um, I would like to connect it to more devices. I'd like to connect it to some original hardware, mm -hmm. um, sort of. Is it Raspberry Pi compatible? Yeah, so um, at the moment it's compatible with PCs, which is Windows and, and Linux, and also the Raspberry Pi type devices that use Linux, mm -hmm. um, so anything like the Odroid or little um, handheld computers like that it works with. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to remember that the games don't necessarily run as fast, you sure. know, a little bit more lag with that, but in terms of the actual software, it's running pretty much just as quick as on the PC. It's more a limitation of the device. I mean, something like the Raspberry Pi 4, each time the technology jumps, you know, it's going to improve those games and make them faster. Yeah, yeah. well, that's not a limitation of the gun, that's the Pi itself. But uh, I think uh, a Pi hooked up with this, or a PC, um, with a shed load of emulators and ROMs, you're going to have a great like, an experience, I think. Um, Andy, I wish you all the best with this in the future and good luck with your Kickstarter. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see the injection moulded final form of it soon. Um, yes. And yeah, if I can get hold, if you get to that stage, if I can get hold of a final production version to, to yeah, show the cave. Yeah, to put one in the cave. That would yeah. be great. Great. Andy, thanks very yeah, much. Best brilliant. of luck. Thank you. And thank you everyone for watching and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.